Morning. Who do we have on the phone? Brooke here. Morning, Brooke. Good morning, Commissioner David Smith. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I ask you to please rise for the opening prayer and pledge of allegiance before we convene our commission meeting. Dear gracious and loving God, we meet a new day with many thanks to the blessings you have bestowed. Lord, we have witnessed the vibrant beauty of your creation with the exceptional fall we have experienced in our valley. May the farmer's harvest be a bountiful one throughout the region. Father, we ask you to guide our county, state, nation over the next week as we vote for our leaders. May we respect others' opinions without retaliation or hate. The mentality of wanting to cancel or ruin one's life because they think differently is destructive and full of evil. We thank you that we live in a country, country where we have the freedom to choose our leaders. We pray that these leaders will not fall under limited knowledge, but seek guidance from you, Father. We pray that we will have ears that will listen and address those that are in need. We pray that our leaders will think independently, but work together for the common good. Lastly, we may we do as you instruct us in your word, to pray for our leaders daily. 
Father, we'll discuss a topic today regarding the revenue for local firefighters and emergency services. Lord, we thank you for these dedicated men and women that leave their families at night, weekends, and holidays to help their fellow residents from harm. They do with a sense of service and love for their community. They are the best of the best in their neighborhoods. They drop everything without, comp without being compensated. May you bless them for their service as they labor out of love. We are thankful that we believe in serving a God that hears our every thought. We ask you for continued guidance. In these things, we humbly ask in your name. Amen. Amen. I believe in just the truth of our life, the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning. At this time, we will convene our commissioner's public meeting. We will ask for the approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. I'll move to approve. I'll second. All fair side? Aye. Aye. So carried. Any public comment on agenda items only at this time? Okay. Any online? Nope. Okay, hearing none, we'll move on. Okay, moving on to uh, 2 point on service award. Uh, we're going to acknowledge uh, Gary Fox, uh, the county printer, for his 20 years of service. Jerry. Morning, Gary. Morning, commissioners. Gary started in a print shop in 2002 as the assistant printer. In 2014, our printer retired, and Gary was promoted to the county printer. Uh, since then, Gary has made some great improvements in the services provided by the print shop. Uh, for example, he introduced uh, multi-part forms, and we started printing customized envelopes in-house. Uh, when we print materials internally, we uh, save money on the product itself, uh, as well as reduce waste by uh, printing required or custom quantities, rather than going out to a print shop and printing uh, 500 envelopes, we, you know, provide 200, you know, for whatever's required. Um, within the last few years, we started printing election day ballots uh, in our print shop. Uh, this provides our organization with a tremendous level of flexibility to pivot and adjust as uh, last-minute changes come from courts and the state. Um, not to mention the huge cost savings that we do there. Uh, Gary has adapted our practices to newer equipment, has improvements are made in that equipment over the years. He goes above and beyond trying to save money where he can. He has taken the, uh, his new assistant, Taylor, under his wing and is passing down his knowledge and experience to the next generation. Uh, Gary also works daily with numerous county employees and uh, all other, or for all their print shop needs. Uh, he is very passionate and conscientious about uh, his work and it shows on a daily basis. Um, on behalf of our management team and all county employees, we'd like to thank Gary for his work that he does and wish him continued success over the next few years. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Tell the public what you do. You can stop the microphone, please. Thank you. I really didn't prepare to say anything, but uh, thank you, Jerry. And uh, it's been a long road for me. Um, I've enjoyed it. Uh, learned a lot of new things. I, I learned that. Uh, you got to keep trying when you get in rough times, and you got to have the will to keep going, and you just keep going. And um, there's a lot of good people here in Lycoming County to work with. I, I can say that too. Um, we work together, and that really makes a strong force here in Lycoming County. I just want to thank everybody. Barry, don't leave yet. Yeah. Go ahead. You know, you truly are one of the folks who works behind the scenes. 
um, and the public doesn't see you. Public doesn't know about you except on a day like today. But it's all the stuff you do when they go to vote, when they get a letter for jury duty, when they're sending in invoices or getting paid as a vendor. That's work coming out of your office and your and your print shop. And it's not a huge print shop. We've done a tour down there and, and uh, you've managed to put together a real high-tech machine down there in, in a limited amount of space. So we thank you for that. Um, and if I'm wrong on that, correct me, but if I recall, it's not, it's not a... It's not, it's not huge. It's not huge, but it has all the tools and you know how to use them. And some of them are very complicated machines. So we thank you for that. And, and uh, you know, it's 20 years, but I'm sure you'll be here at least another 10. So we, we <laughs> welcome you and we look forward to that because we need you. And the public needs you and the public thanks you. Thank you. Gary, it's been an honor to know you for the 20 years pleasure to, to know you and uh, you, you do work behind the scenes and uh, you, you save the residents of this county thousands of dollars thousands from your service what you provide and uh, you do it without flaw there's no mistakes I've never heard people say there's mistakes from the printing shop so uh, you do a fantastic job you always have a smile on your face when I see you and your Yankee hat on <laughs> and uh, I know it was rough playoffs but <laughs> but, uh, we won't talk about that. Okay. <laughs> but uh, it, it's a pleasure to have you here, and we hope many more years of success to you. And uh, we values values value you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to take about five minutes, so we can get the <laughs> award. But yeah, you know, 20 years ago, I mean, just think about that as a senior in high school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't no. do well math yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah when you walk over to the print shop uh, you see how it touches every department in the county and uh, you're not in the most ideal spot you know as far as the building but uh, you, you never complain and uh, I hear that we are gonna make a move over to the third street plaza uh, hopefully that uh, you get the space that you need and uh, get a little bit more organized not because of you but because of us and the limited space that you have there so uh, we're looking forward to that too and hoping that it gives you a not that you don't have a bad attitude but that you have a bad attitude but it will improve for sure um, I want to thank you for all your service Thank you. Thank you. He's going up to, to yeah, get was, the award. Whenever yeah. your coworkers <coughs> like to say something, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's when we see coworkers show up for these, it's it's out of respect for the, for the employee, and you can see everybody here. They they respect you so much, and uh, and they value you and, and what you bring to the county. And that's one thing when you do retire, you know, that you don't really miss the job. But you sure miss the people you work with because it's like a family here. Yep, it is. It truly is. And, uh, you know, they support each other and, and help each other. And, uh, that's what's that's the beautiful thing about working for the county. And, uh, and we see that with the retirees is when they go to retiree lunches, they get to see each other again and, and smile and reminisce about the good times and the fun they had while they were accomplishing a mission. So, We'd like to get a picture with you, sure. and uh, and staff come up and get a picture with them too, please. And if you, if we're not putting you on the spot if you want to, but we, we appreciate it.
closer. And we gotta get closer. Somebody gotta do this to him. I like to say turning sideways is gonna save some days. No, no, you guys are gonna have so many people in the front. Meal down. All right. It's like a little league part. I'm short, so I'm going to go down here. What is going on about that glow? Smile. One more. And then she's taking it. She's taking it. Smile. Okay. I am young. I had to do that a lot. All right, moving on to information item, Maya, uh, bids for food. Good morning, commissioners. That morning. time of the uh, year again where we're moving forward to 2023, so we're going out to bid for food products. For the prison, right? For the prison yep. and for your lease. We do it on a quarterly basis. So it takes about, you almost have to do it two months in advance because of the, the nature of how many products there are and you know, to secure the best price at the time, too. Absolutely. So, How many times a year do we do that, Maya? Uh, four times a year. Four times a year. Mm -hmm. okay. And I'm sure there's going to be an increase with the price of food. No doubt. Um, quite honestly, what um, how the contracts I've started doing since COVID is that I do it on a weekly quote basis, and we just try to lock in on a weekly basis based off of what our need is. It's been more demanding, but it's been working. Um, I foresee that being maybe the, the norm probably at least for the next year or so, especially with inflation um, hitting as bad as it is on, on food. It's going to, you know, add an extra layer, unfortunately, I think, to the process. And so. now we have a shortage of diesel fuel, which is going to increase yes. the cost of the... We had a discussion on that earlier in the week, and uh, we're starting to plan now um, as a worst-case scenario. And that'll drive up the cost even more in the grocery stores. Oh, sure. Yeah, everywhere. I mean, it's going to hit, you know, here and in, in our our home pockets as well, so. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank you. Okay, moving on to reports, Kaylin. Good morning, Kaylin. No pressure. Yeah. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Um, presented for your ratification is a revision of invoices that were due through November 9th, 2022, that were paid on November 1st, 2022, in the amount of $907,681.60. The breakdown is as follows. 55.56% is coming from the general fund at $504,342.82. 33.86% is coming from grants and other sources at $307,322.52. And 10.58% is coming from RMS at $96,016.26. Okay, any questions for? Oh, I want to thank you for reading all those numbers because we have people watching who may not have a copy of this in front of them. Mm -hmm. So we appreciate you giving them that information. Okay, got a motion. And another thing oh, that we appreciate is um, we have basically a, a brand new staff in fiscal payroll accounts payable receivables um, and it's been some trying times and we want to thank you for putting in the effort I see you people here at seven o'clock in the morning I see you people here at six o'clock at night and uh, you're doing your best to do uh, the county's work so well thank you I appreciate that yeah the entire staff has stepped up the plate and really seen a very difficult situation Yes. Thank you. Thank government you. accounting isn't like a It's so fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Okay, I have a motion. I'll move to approve. I'll second that. <coughs> On your side? Aye. 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 So, so carried. 
At this time, we'll recess the Commissioner's Public Meeting for the Board of Assessments Revisions, and we'll convene the Board of Assessments Revisions at this time. Maureen Brook. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm here seeking your approval to certify the tax rolls for 2023. We have 51,997 taxable parcels with an assessment of $5,765,256,341. We have 2,062 exempt parcels with an assessment of $1,048,631,256,341. We have 
Well, I will email you the five-year history with the certified tax rolls. Right. Yep. That. That'd be helpful. That would that would be nice, and we'll pass it on to the paper. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, hey, Brooke, before yeah. I adjourn the board of assessments, uh, could you please stay on the line till the end? Under commissioner comments, I'm going to address something um, that uh, if you have any comments on at that point, I would invite you to. Okay, okay. that's not a problem. Great, thank you. So at this time, we'll adjourn the board of assessments provisions, and we'll. Reconvene the commission of public meeting at this time. Personnel actions. Emily? Do we need to take any action to, to certify the parcels? I know. I was going to say you need to vote on that. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. That's 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 All right. I'll move to approve the and certify the tax parcels of 2023 as presented. Hey, Let me reconvene the, sorry, or the, um, um, the um, assessment board's revision. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. I'll move to approve the board of assessment tax rolls for 2023 provided by the director. A second. All favor say aye. Aye. Aye, so carried. <coughs> Thank you. Now at this time we'll adjourn for the assessments. Mr. Pogmeen. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. Good morning, commissioners. I yeah. am seeking approval for the following <laughs> personnel actions that are listed here. The first one will be Nicole Stroop for the prison coming as a CO1 relief for a full-time replacement at $20 per hour, 80 hours per pay period with an anticipated start date of 11-14. Next one is for the pre-release center, Katie Shea for a resident supervisor one position. It is a full-time replacement for 17-18 per hour, 80 hours per pay period with an anticipated start date of November 14th. Next for the prison, Tim Taylor is coming as a part-time correctional officer for the new relief position at $20 per hour, will not exceed 1,000 hours, and anticipated to start on November 15th. For the pre-release center, Ikeem Alau is joining us as a resident supervisor one full-time replacement position, $17.18 per hour, 80 hours per pay period, with an anticipated start date of November 14th. For the pre-release center again is Tyron Fisher joining us as a resident supervisor one position, full-time replacement, 1718 per hour, 80 hours per pay period with an anticipated start date of November 14th. And lastly, we have Carol Gilberti joining us for the courts as a tip staff as a part-time replacement position for 1043 per hour, not to exceed a thousand hours, anticipated start date of December 5th. Okay, can I have a motion to accept these? I'll move to approve. I'll second. Day. Any comments on the um, okay. <coughs> aye. Aye. aye? Aye. Thank you. And, and uh, Allie, how are we doing with the prison uh, with the recruitment? We're good. We've actually seen an influx in applicants for the part time positions that we have. And for full time, we've seen, um, I believe, and don't quote me, this isn't the exact number, but 20 applicants over the last 26 days. So that's pretty good, including weekend traffic, which we usually don't see for our applicants. Good, and we're getting uh, applicants for the part-time, too? Yep. Great. That's good news. Yeah. Okay, we try to get relief for those yep. positions and the staff that's been working and dedicated. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. This time we'll recess the commissioner's public meeting for the salary board and convene the salary board. I am seeking approval for the following salary board actions. For the prison, um, we would reclassify the nurse supervisor position from a pay grade 10 to a pay grade 12 due to market adjustment. Okay, can I have a motion? We have the floor with us. Just walked Just walked in? She's good. I'm moving. What's that? We're, we're, we're discussing the salary board, discussing the, uh, the adjustment. Uh, you want to state it again? Or, uh, Allie? Sure. Um, move to vote to approve for the following salary board actions for the prison reclassification for the nurse supervisor position from a pay grade 10 to a pay grade 12 due to market adjustment. Okay, got a motion. I'll move to approve. I'll second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? Can I say Yes, something? absolutely. Come on up. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to reiterate on this that I think it's great that we're starting to adjust and continuing to adjust, but I would just reiterate that we're doing it a little bit at a time, and I know there's cost issues, but I feel that it's important to bring this up 
when these happen for the rest of the employees as well. Absolutely, and we're in the tail end of a compensation study that we are been discussing weekly, and um, we have been given the final numbers on that, and the three commissioners are discussing that and how we're going to implement that and vote on that um, in the near future. Well, that won't handle everything. That won't handle everything, but it'll start it's to start. address it. It's the start of it. But, but I would vote no. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would. I'd just like to make a just a point of clarification on this particular action. <clears throat> uh, the no nurse supervisor position uh, was missed when we took care of the LPN market rated. I think that might have been the case. Yeah. 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 So the other yeah. thing, just to re it, it isn't so much that we try that we're trying to go slowly, and I'm not saying that's what you were implying, but there's a massive amount of work that has to be done behind each one of these. So whether it's you know, finding out and calculating market adjustments or more complicated issues of how many years experience people have, where they stand. So a lot of it is that we have a HR department that's trying to do all the normal stuff it does, open enrollment, mm -hmm. dealing with people's issues, recruitment, interviewing, hiring, firing, and then on top of it, they're trying to do it. So some of it is that they're they're trying to do the best they can. I do understand that. Okay. I would and just go back to that we stopped using a pay scale that was deemed to be too expensive, and then we waited 10 years to get to this point. So it's on their shoulders, but it's work that could have been done even if it was incremental over those 10 years, whereas now it seems like it, it has become more of an emergency from a staffing issue, from a uh, retention issue those types of things. So that's why I feel that I need to bring it up. You're talking about the step structure. The, I, it was before I was here, I think you're talking about. It was, about, right. that was okay. stopped. And okay. then, but we waited so long, it, we fell out of market competition for salaries, even though as county government, we're not always at the market right. because we have other things to offer. It is public service, et cetera, et cetera. We've talked about all of that before. Well, that's a good point. And we have to figure out a way to keep ourselves Within well, a I don't market, it's a good point. Well, no, 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 no. But we were wait. out of we were not out of range with other counties and other states. Uh, well, that's not what I'm saying. What I mean okay, is, well, that's what she's saying. No, that's okay. why I said market. I didn't mean. I I mean we're talking you're, about it on you're here. Talking about pay. I am. And our pay was fine in comparison to everybody else's pay within our uh, class counties, and even up to a fourth class county. Okay, our pay were very comparable. And in some cases, more. Okay, the the market rate has to do with what's happened since COVID, and and where we're seeing you know lack of of employees wanting to take a job, uh, the price of the inflation, and so on. That's the market adjustment we're trying to make right now. Yeah, and what I was going to simply say is that we are trying to find a mechanism going forward to both deal with current. People. So, like, if someone comes with five years' experience right now in a particular position in the planning department, we hire them at the beginning. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And so we've been trying to put together a policy that will actually allow us to bring that person in with the five years' experience and put them on the salary structure where they would belong. But to do that, we have to make sure they're not coming in and working along someone who's been here for five years, who's also, or for seven years, who's and so we're we're working on that. That's that's the point I want to make. And the commissioner has his point as he was here before me, so I, I don't know what what that that's fine. But I'm just trying to say to you and to the employees that we are trying to do yeah. something so that we can both deal with the structural problem we have, and then going forward, from time to time, we will deal with market adjustment. In other words, not every job and every position will require a market adjustment every year because it ebbs and flows. There was a time when there were lots of RNs around. You know, right now the competition for RNs and LPNs happens to be very, very high. And the same thing with other positions, whether it's operating at the landfill or whether it's some other. So we're trying to do that. That's all I wanted to say to you. I think, I think the oversight was when the steps structure was stopped, there was nothing put in Correct. place as a alternative. Right. And it has produced over the last decade a lot of inconsistencies right. where you have staff making more and supervisors and those situations right. have evolved and then you have a, um, a 
uh, narrowing of the uh, pay scale where a supervisor might only be making a thousand or two thousand dollars more than a media employee with a lot less experience. So what Jessica has worked on um, with Allie, which would cost the county probably three to five hundred thousand dollars if we were to go out and have it done out, out of house. Oh, yeah. They have worked uh, hours on this problem. Um, they have brought us a, a good solution that um, I think is a fair solution. It starts to address it. And then what we'll do is if we adopt that and decide on that, then we can, again, take little steps each year to address other issues. But we won't be able to address everything immediately. I understand that. But we'll be able to address a good part of it immediately. Mm -hmm. And, so, so, and what's going on right now, just so that we're, we're up front uh, and we're not behind closed doors, uh, is we recognize that uh, our uh, planning department and our IT department uh, will be the next. And, and uh, this compensation study is, uh, has to be implemented. And then uh, we'll be working on uh, uh, clerks. So it's not that this isn't a topic of conversation every single day. It is. We're, we're working on this every single day. And, but there's a lot of work. And, yeah. and I know Scott didn't mean hours. He, he meant months. Sure. So they've been working on this for months. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been very hard on them. And at the same time, we don't want to do this. We, we should do this when we do a new budget. Because, you know, if you're going to put a, this is going to cost money, you don't want to do it in the middle of the year. Right. So now's the time as we get to and discuss a new budget. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we're trying to look forward in the future is that if there are reclassifications that need to be done, they be done at budget time, which is yeah. what the commissioner was talking about. Exactly. Instead of all year long, right. we spend a huge amount of time, and oftentimes it comes on an emergency. It's like, oh, we got to do this now, right, because there's a crisis. And, and that's not a good way to run to run a railroad. The thing is this, and, and I just want to, I, I wasn't here when it was eliminated, but here was the problem. The pre prior pay structure, raises were in the range of, I think, about 8.5% a year, right? Because the step was about five, 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 five to five and a half. Five to five and a half? They were, they were actually four and a half. In between yeah. each step was four and a half. In between yeah. was four and a half, but then there was also on top of that people would get a cost of living. Bonus. A bonus or cost of living or whatever, right? So if you take four and a half and you, whatever it is, it's money, right? Okay. Whether you call it a cull or whether you call it a wage increase, whether you call it a step between grades, it's money. So the, the, the combination of the four and a half plus probably what, two? Well, it was, it, it wasn't four and a half. It, it, those steps were built as a year out and then after I think a couple of years, it was every two years. But the, the thing about it, at that time, that's what uh, we saw what was going on in contracts, teachers' contracts, police contracts, and <coughs> the board of commissioners at the time saw that to bring the salaries up to where they need to be on a professional level, they should be what they were. Now, what then happened was you saw you go the other direction where cost of living sort of started becoming two, two and a half percent. So it had to be, I agree with the commissioner, it had to be adjusted but there had to be something in place, and nothing was put in place. Well, here's what I want to just point out to you. In math, there's a rule of 72, right? You invest money at a certain interest rate, that money doubles. Well, that applies to other things, mm -hmm. right? If you're, if you're paying a wage increase. So in, on the rule of 72, if you're going up even 6% a year, your payroll doubles in 12 years. Well, and it affects your retirement, too, Absolutely. don't forget. It affects your retirement and how much you put in. But just the, the payroll doubling in 12 years. Yeah. Now, here's the other thing that was a real problem. Between 2010 and, I forget, 2015, we added 50 new employees. Mm -hmm. 50 new employees added millions and millions of dollars to the payroll. And so those two factors, that, you know, the first factor, uh, the prior... The board prior to me, Commissioner Messer and the others, tried to get that under control by eliminating the steps. I understand. We all made, in the last term, we made a push to eliminate, to reduce the number of people through attrition by cross-training people, getting people mm -hmm. to cross-train, all in an effort to try to get it, to get it under control. I mean, I think that people, if we can work towards a workforce that's highly skilled, able to cross-train, and compensate them higher for that ability, that's probably a smarter approach than having 
massive number of employees who can't do anyone else's job, but and then therefore we have to try to keep the wages down. Right. Right. I, and I, I realize all of that. It's just a matter of we had a structure, it went away, and it's yeah. taken too long to get back to a structure. That's totally, the totally point. agree. Yeah. And we're trying totally to do agree. that. We're trying to do that. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. It's always Thank good you. to discuss yeah. these things. It's good for the public to try to understand okay. also the challenges that are faced. So the vote is three to one carried. Yeah. At this time, we'll. We have come up. Oh, I'm sorry. We have one more. Yeah. Um, so for the salary board for the prison, um, Kim Foreman would be reclassified to a pay grade 12 um, per the nurse supervisor position moving to the pay grade 12. I'll move. Okay. I'll second. All clear, say aye. 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 So carried. Thank I think you. We want to thank Kim for her outstanding uh, work here at the prison right now. I mean, she, she put in a lot of extra time. And look, to that last conversation we have, employees have been very patient. They really have. And, and uh, we appreciate that. We've lost some employees. We've lost some because they've gone to the state or they've gone other places where they're making more money. And, and we don't want to lose more. And so we're hoping to get that compensation practice policy up for a vote probably within the next two weeks. Yeah, I would say and that's going to address our current employees. It's going, to, it's going to enable us to look at someone and say, you've got X number of years experience, you have a bachelor's degree, you have a certification in heavy equipment, whatever it is, and we're going to be able to give, adjust their compensation based on that. We have to vote on it because if we're going to adopt it, it has to be an extra budget. Right. And you're working on the extra budget figures. Right. Okay, one more. Yep. Next, we have the commissioner's request to add a full-time procurement and grant officer position, and that would be in a pay grade eight. Okay, we have Maya here this morning. Would you like to make any comments? Uh, other than it's just really, yeah. Thank you. I you know, from my perspective, you know, when I first started here, um, you know, I don't think we're where we're at now, and with the ARPA funds, the COVID funds, um, you know, I think I operated under, you know, staff for a very long time and now I can just no longer do it with the magnitude of work that's coming through my office and uh, so I appreciate this I'm glad that you guys took the, the opportunity to look at my office and uh, reevaluate it to give me this person because it's greatly needed and it'll take the load off and it'll assist with um, the necessary cross training you know I said this several times to you you know if I just get hit by the milk truck tomorrow you know um, no, no. I'm yeah Jeff's, I don't want that just be <laughs> <laughs> I'm always, I was always concerned about the continuity of operations and uh, so this will afford me to be able to do that and to make sure that we get proper cost training to you know set the county up for success should um, someone move on I was listening to some campaign speeches uh, by both parties and they recognize the amount of money the federal government is handing out and one of the things that they're talking about right now is accountability mm -hmm. and so they they want records they're going to demand records mm -hmm. okay and uh when we're talking about the money that we receive just in arpa funds and then the cares funds and, and we're just a small piece of the pie and you only have a couple people if that to uh really evaluate it monitor it and, and, and request it mm -hmm. right it's uh something long overdue i mean right now your staff is including you is two and a half people that's correct and both of those people are fairly new yep and you're handling millions and millions of dollars mm -hmm. with the grants and then on top of that you dealt with covid monies mm -hmm. 10.2 million and now 22 million dollars worth of arpa monies yep and um and, you know, then the purchasing side in itself you know i'm tasked with every dollar that's spent looking at that making sure for legal compliance and that's over 100 million dollars you know and i will tell you now that you know is a big big thing too because you know they go hand in hand you know when you're monitoring grants then you're spending it so then it comes on the other side of things so um, there's just lots of you know procurement laws and regulations and compliance issues on both ends that require you know a lot of time and effort and you know I'm sure no Matt knows <laughs> nothing's easy um, we're dealing with an issue right now just you know something simple as you know ballistic shields trying to get that done um, unfortunately you know procurement code has not been updated to reflect the times and that is the challenge 
Um, it's something that I've advocated for in my um, you know, conference area with our professionals, um, other procurement professionals. It's something we're trying to work, but ultimately, again, it's up to legislation and our legislators to make those changes. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the COVID emergency declaration may have uh, expired, um, but the effects uh, haven't changed. In fact, uh, they've been exacerbated by a whole bunch of other, other factors. And so some of the flexibility that uh, we had under the declaration, uh, we no longer have. But yet the prices are volatile and they continue to uh, rise sometimes on an hourly level and it's very difficult for miners to have to do their job. It requires a lot of unique thinking, <laughs> you know. You know, two points on this. One that you mentioned. In the next year, and whoever is the next Board of Commissioners, we have to work on developing depth of leadership. And we're all aware of it and it isn't that we're not concerned about it, it's, it's a question of um, you know, all the things that have gone on, COVID and everything else. But we really need to not have any departments where if the leadership has to leave or chooses to leave, that we can't run the organization. Um, and uh, we probably had a learning experience this year with, with some of the departments where that happened. So <clears throat> that's something that I think all three of us are thinking about next year and also um, in, in the next board needs to think about it. The other thing about your, this position is that, as Commissioner Masser mentioned, there's probably 28 to 30 million dollars that we've gotten just that we never would have had before. 22 from ARPA, I forget how much the COVID was. 10.2. 10.2. 10 so there, right there, you're looking at 32 million that we have to process. Well, we don't want to just process it in a way that doesn't leverage it. We want to process it in a way that ties in with other grant opportunities. And then separate from that, is all the money, for example, broadband. This state got how much in broadband? 250 yeah. million? Yeah. 250 million. And is that, Jenny, do you know off the top of your head if that's correct? I do not. Okay. Shannon or John might. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, don't know what this, I don't know what the state got. It's a huge amount of money. And we need to make sure we're in a position to know where the grants are and how to get them and how to bring that money back to, to build out our county, right? Because mm -hmm. that's where the future is. Matt, that's a good point, so. Richard, because uh, you know, we have a limited tax base, and, and the way communities grow and get things accomplished is mm -hmm. locating these grants. Mm -hmm. And we have department heads such as Hutch who goes out and finds these things, mm -hmm. works with Maya, mm -hmm. and gets those things accomplished and those things get purchased, and that makes our county a better community. Yeah, yeah it's all a team effort. I mean, it really is, and that's the thing. You know, there's so much planning that goes in to grants, I mean, hence why planning is my biggest, you yep. know, department. Um, it takes a village, really, to, to get the job done. I mean, we all have very important roles in each area that we do, but um, without one person not being available because of something else, it, it's, it puts things on the back burner. I want to make sure that if I'm getting pulled in a different direction that someone can fill my shoes to keep operations moving for them or any other department that needs to keep moving operationally. If you locate those grants, the courts locate those grants, the department heads locate those mm -hmm. grants. And like you said, they work together as a team to get them accomplished and, yep. and bring those monies to like coming counties. Because if, if we don't go after them, somebody else is going to get them. That's and, exactly and they're right. And make their communities better. Mm -hmm. But what's important, though, to understand is if you don't follow the rules, what? you don't get they're it. Go, oh, oh, no, you can get it. Oh, but they, they can say, oh, well, you did this. Pay it back. This way, you pay it back. Oh, absolutely. We watched the county in Pennsylvania. I won't mention it, but it was a ten million dollar building. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. And they didn't do it right. No. I mean, and, and, and not maliciously. They right. They, it's they just you got to make sure you if know we what you're doing. Same, pay it back. We almost went down the same road. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and mm -hmm. we caught it. So now we're we're doing a proper yes paperwork so that when we get to selling part of the golf course. Mm -hmm. We've done the okay. transaction. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, there's so yeah. many contingencies on between grants and purchasing um, that you have to really look at, and you know, each situation is unique, and that's you know the complexity of the job. Yeah. You know, commissioners. I think uh, everybody's aware of the increased workload due to the, the recent federal revenues that have come in through CARES and, and uh, ARP, but. You know, on a, on a normal non bid revenue uh, year, um, you know, we, we have 
roughly a hundred and ten million dollar budget and of that somewhere around 36 37 million is property tax the rest is federal state grant and aid uh, and those are the funds that you guys manage and process okay okay and uh, here it is Krista this is the compensation work that they've they've been working on pages after page every employee is listed on this in the entire county this is what we have to I was looking at last night in my house this is what we have to review before we make that decision on in two weeks before the budget but this is the work that that Allie and, and Jessica every single employee looking at their current pay their current education their current uh, years of service and and what it would do to a market value going forward uh, some may be increased some may not be but it's it's a start in the right direction it's something we have to continue to discuss and then vote on and, and just to be clear there are going to be a lot of people who are not going to be adjusted okay not because we don't think you're valuable but because it's it's a it's being used in connection with a policy we're putting into effect that says that if we have to vote on this but if you have uh one percent for each year of experience you have you know uh one or two percent i forget what it is for your bachelor's or your associates or for your certification and so forth so it is trying to correct the inequities that exist and and allow us also in the future on future hiring to be able to look at people when they come in and say oh you have five years experience as a telecommunicator or you have uh, you know, you have a bachelor's degree or a master's in the planning. Now, obviously, it has to be relevant, right? If you're working in the planning department and your bachelor is in uh, in food, pastry arts. Pastry arts. Underwater basket. Okay, but um, so so water basket weaving. <laughs> so they're going to be they're going to be a number of people who are not adjusted on that one. Okay, and then we're going to look into the market adjustment the following year so I just don't want to set expectations that everybody yeah is getting adjusted but there's a huge number I mean it's close to 182 I think that are being adjusted and this is going to help us for example with operators at the landfill well we have an operator who comes to us with 10 years experience or recently we lost an operator with 11 years experience mm -hmm. right under this policy that person would have been adjusted um, and so we need to get that out. Yep. So we're just about done with the first step. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I have a motion for the uh, adding the procurement and grant officer position. I'll move to approve. We'll second. Second. All in say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Okay. 4 0. Yeah. At this time, we'll adjourn the salary board and we convene the Commissioner's public meeting. We thank the Commissioner for joining us. Yes. Moving on to TDA actions. Allie. I am seeking approval for the following TDA actions for the prison reclassification for the nurse supervisor role from a pay grade 10 to a pay grade 12 due to market adjustment. Okay. And then for the prison reclassification to Kim Foreman for pay grade 12. And finally, the commissioner is adding a full time procurement and grant officer in a pay grade 8. Okay, I got a motion. I move to approve those three actions. I'll second. Any further discussion or questions about it? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 So carried. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. All right, moving on to action items 9.1 and 9.2. Mike. Good morning again. Good morning. Um, this is to approve a proposal with they can apply to uh, Ameriprise Incorporated. This is for the prison. They had an emergency um, repair for due to a leaking refrigerant return. So um, this is to get the repair done. I will note that the $18,600 proposal that you have is just for the repair. Unfortunately, you know, due to the refrigerant and the fluctuating prices on that, we don't know where that's going to come in at. But you know, ultimately, it doesn't. At the end of the day, it's covered by procurement code. On the fact that this vendor is a CoStar's vendor, so it exempts us from doing any bidding requirements. Okay. A motion. Uh, the next item I have before you is the Act 13 agreements with West Branch Fireman's Association. It's for building upgrades being performed by Mama and Kafka, and I believe we have some representatives here that would like to discuss their projects. Absolutely. I'd like to hear from them. Who would like to go first? Uh, 
morning. You got it. Good morning, commissioners. <laughs> um, I'm Mike Gardner, the uh, president of uh, the Catholic organization here in Waynesport. We're located at uh, 1750 West Third Street. We are a training organization established in the late 80s to uh, provide uh, retail training to our local responders, including fire, EMS, and police. Uh, the building had a, an inspection done in 2019, and the inspection uh, identified problems to the building that resulted in us not to continue live fire training. Um, the building is utilized for live fire training for our certification of our firefighters. We are a test site uh, for the Pennsylvania State Fire Academy to test our local uh, firefighters to a certification level at the national uh, the, a pro board status. Um, unable to continue a burning level, we were in jeopardy of losing um, our testing uh, procedures and testing site. And the closest one that we have is, uh, to us would be in Harrisburg or State College. And currently, we are traveling to State College to uh, finish up our training for our certifications, um, which puts an additional burden on our responders to travel to State College or Harrisburg when we have the ability to do it here in uh, Lake Cumberland County. So, so the project was to bring the building back up to the original status of uh, being able to conduct live fire training um, by uh, fixing the second floor burn room and the first floor burn room and other uh, components of the building that were in need of repair. So this was uh, uh, funding was uh, uh, um, greatly appreciated from the commissioners as approved um, and we look forward to uh, getting the building uh, renovated and fixed to do back to the original status when it was purchased uh, some time ago um, uh, for our, our local fire chiefs that did it back in the uh, early 90s. Okay, thank you, Mike. Anybody else? Yes, come on up. Uh, good morning, commissioners. My name is Dave Demick. I'm uh, speaking on behalf of the MAMA organization and also the County Fire Chiefs and West Branch organization. Um, over the last 10 years, we've realized the need to work at a county level uh, to help bring about training in our area. <clears throat> we've um, completed a number of projects. One of the first ones was bringing county training hours to this area, which at the time had almost depleted. Uh, as of recent, we've been one of the top counties in the Bucks County system, uh, providing the most hours of training uh, to our first responders uh, in their system, which is a great achievement for us. We've also worked to acquire uh, another Act 13 grant previous for uh, training props that we use. These training props are available to all the firefighters uh, throughout the county, free of charge. Um, we've maintained them, and this is a, a, another project that we've worked on. We're currently working on another project with uh, acquiring fire apparatus to help, work, uh, help with training at the various facilities throughout the, the county at no charge to the fire companies. Uh, finding fire equipment to do training throughout the area has been difficult at times because most fire departments don't always have the equipment to give up to go to training sessions that are needed for two, three, four hour training sessions. This is another project uh, that we've come together and worked on as a team at the county level uh, that will benefit both training grounds um, I can tell you that the MAMA training facility is going to continue to work with the West Branch and we're we'll continuing to strive to provide free or very low cost training to our county responders. Uh, on behalf of all of us, I want to take, thank the county commissioners for your support. We are not able to do any of this stuff without your support. So on behalf of the West Branch and MAMA, thank you very much. Okay. Dave, can I ask you a couple questions? Is it, first of all, I think all three of us think it's great that Kafka and Mama are working together. And uh, we had a meeting upstairs with all of you, and uh, I think that that's something that we should all celebrate. Um, is it fair to say that Mama primarily works with volunteer fire companies? It's open to anybody. It's open to anybody. It's primarily volunteer, right? <coughs> uh, probably because of its location. Exactly. Um, it's a little more, it's difficult for the. Um, the city of Williamsport to come out to our location when they're on duty. Right. However, their members have been able to take advantage of those training grounds when those classes are held. Can you tell right. where the training grounds are at? Because I don't think a lot of people know. So the MAMA training grounds are located right off the Pensdale exit uh, 
it's off of one, Interstate 180 Super between Highway. the Interstate and the, yeah. the Light Company Mall. So when you look right. off of the area of Sam's Club, that's where it sets. And you access it kind of through the um, area where you would go to the, I think it's the Muncie American Legion. Yeah. Right. Um, and it was formed many, many years ago. Uh, I, th I think it actually um, came shortly after the West Branch. West Branch is actually the older, the oldest of all the organizations, and it was formed back in the 1930s, uh, back when those fire chiefs realized that we needed to come together and start to coordinate things kind of at more of a county level, right. um, things that benefit everybody, because it's too hard to do it just on a, on a fire department level. There's not enough people, there's not enough time. If we can share assets and resources, we're able to uh, operate more efficiently. Right, and that's and these aren't trick questions. I'm I'm trying to get the public to understand what's going on here because it's very significant. It goes beyond simply the county appropriating some money from Act 13. I think there's been a conscious understanding among the firefighters in the county that it's not going to happen tomorrow. But the long-term solution to the problem, to help the problem with the volunteers, is to find a way to use both the paid services in the third class city and the volunteers and to see if we can't work together. I mean, I, I could be wrong on that, but I think that that's what's happening around the state and the country. And I think it's great that it looks like we're beginning to go in that direction here. Is that correct or? I think there's a lot of cooperation. Um, yes. You're starting to see uh, um, more of a combination type service come out. Uh, if you look to the north, there's just the recently formed Northern Lycoming Fire Rescue and EMS Service right. uh, that's been formed where they have two people on duty. Uh, they staff an ambulance, so they're able to handle uh, emergency medical calls, but at the same time they are firefighter, trained firefighters. Uh, so when they come off that ambulance at a working structure fire or at a vehicle accident, they are able to operate. And uh, we saw the benefits of that at the uh, last structure fire that they had in Ralston, mm -hmm. where we were able to, a, a combined effort between the paid <coughs> and the volunteers, we were able to get a quick hit on a fire that actually saved that house and kept that fire to a room and content fire, <coughs> which probably would not have happened prior to this. Um, I know Loyal Sock and South Williamsport now have the SMART program. So uh, what you're going to see is a need for these types of projects because we're going to have a need for a workforce. And I can tell you, Commissioner, right now that um, both organizations are finding it somewhat difficult uh, to find people to meet the standards that we're looking for to fill these positions. So not only does this um, help the volunteers and bring volunteer firefighters in and get them well trained, but it's also going to help provide a workforce for what comes in the future. And we've seen that statewide where we had, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we had uh, 360,000 volunteers. It's down to under 30,000 statewide. We just had a meeting with uh, with Matoorsville and Plunkins Creek and Cascade Township that are doing something very similar that South Wayne Sport <coughs> and Wellsock is doing, that the Northern Alliance is doing. There's more of a regional approach where the, the departments are cooperating with each other to accomplish the mission to make sure there's, there's service there with the volunteers that they have. Absolutely, and you're even seeing discussion between uh, those groups themselves. Between the, I can tell you for a fact that Northern Lycoming and uh, the SMART system have been talking about how we can complement each other. So there's there's even that discussion going on where I think you'll see those systems expand and grow. Well, I just want to thank you all, the, both the paid and the volunteers who are here and um, for, for your efforts to do this, to come together and to find a way to solve the problem for the public. And we'll certainly try to do our part in terms of uh, whatever we can do to help out financially with Act 13 and other funds. And Commissioner Metzger made a comment about uh, meeting with Cascade, Market Creek. And, but what's critical is the fact that um, <coughs> the township supervisors were there also. And, and I think they're starting to realize that it's not the county's responsibility. Okay, it, it is each individual municipality and township. And uh, they're coming to the table. They're offering money they're offering solutions and we're certainly going to help them uh, we, we believe that uh, act 13 funds were a blessing and uh, we know you know we have to provide public safety and and your departments it's, it's critical 
uh, that you have the funds needed to, for education, training, and putting skilled people uh, there in place. So we're kind of excited. And for the old timers, you know, and I'm, you know, I'll tell you, old time, I shouldn't say that. But you're, you are setting a precedent in this community. You're going to leave a legacy that only the future will understand. Okay, I, I think it's great, and I've worked with you many times, Dave. Um, I think it's great what you're doing, uh, but not only that. It's the time that you're putting in to make it happen. I mean, this is this is at night. This is you live, eat, drink, sleep. This is what your life is. Uh, it's a calling, and uh, we can't thank you enough. So, yeah, and I want the public to remember these. This is life death situations. You know, you live in a rural area, and you don't have the volunteers to respond and they have to come from 20 minutes further, that can make the difference whether that person lives or not. And I shared their day with Matorzo and Bunkins Creek and uh, Cascade. A friend of mine, a very experienced hiker, in February 28th went out on a hike in a remote area and due to the ice had a tragic accident. If those three townships would not have worked together, she would have died. She would, she would not, she's a living miracle right now. And, uh, and if they didn't work together as a unit to rescue her that day, there's no, no, no doubt she won't be alive. That's what you guys do. And you do it on a regular basis. You save lives. And, uh, and we can't thank you enough. Yeah. Thank you. By the way, just for the, for the public, the, there's a $300,000 uh, in this Act 13 grant in this document. Uh, distributed 150,000 to Mama, 150,000 to Kafka, to complete projects that are outlined in Exhibit B, and they're very specific uh, descriptions of what will be done with the money, how Mama will use it, and how Kafka will, will use it. So, just so people understand. Does anybody else have anything they want to share or express? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. I have a motion on action item 9.2. I'll move to approve. I'll second. Any further discussion or questions? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 So carried. You, you don't have to stay for the rest of the meeting. You know you're Mike, guys. Mike, Mike. <laughs> hey, Mike, you do. <laughs> if you would, real quick, Chief. Oh, yeah, right. Commissioners, I would like to real quick to thank uh, the City of Williamsport Chief Ungston, Deputy Chief Lucas, oh, yeah. and uh, platoon chiefs and uh, Mike Gardner was one of my fire instructors and uh, thank you very much for the response you give to the transfer station all of you uh, night and day so they have responded to some ugly calls with people falling and other accidents at the transfer station with fire and stuff so thank you very much on behalf of RMS we appreciate it thank you we, we do have two important commissioner comments if you want to stick around if you have time or you read about in the paper <laughs> I have to say, Jason was my best student, too. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a paid endorsement. Yeah. <laughs> a little out of your job, Tom. I, will, I have a question. Um, I just want to know, is there a junior firefighter program? Guys? Um, it, it's usually rel relative to each department, um, because that's such a, such a local issue. Um, as an example, I'll speak as Deputy Chief of Montoursville. Um, we used to have the Boy Scouts of America Explorer program. Um, that the Boy Scouts have actually declined a little bit. So now, yes, we as Matorzo, we do have a junior program, but it's a very local issue. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, the city being a, a paid career department, um, they can't have that. But what we they do uh, reach out during public, uh, during fire prevention week. Um, you know, the, the students are made aware of everything. They do provide those programs and other community programs. Um, Joe, what is the like coming to? Yeah, I'll direct it. Uh, oh, oh, active Chief Hutchinson. Comments, uh, yeah. Every department is regulated highly by the Department of Labor. There's certain things junior members can do and can't. In fact, there's legislation to move that along. A lot of us older junior members know that we kind of skirted those rules <laughs> in our younger days. Oh, yeah. um, but it's they're very serious rules. But what we've done, what the city of Winsport has also helped with, there's an emergency services program at Winsport Area School District that has young people going, starting when they're freshmen now, 
and going through. And not all of them come through, not all of them want to do. This is one of those things, it's not like the Rotary Club or something. Not everybody does it. You either do this or you don't do this. But some of them we have, we were doing testing for them last year in their final exams, and the one gentleman donned his protective equipment so well that one of the city platoon chiefs looked and goes, you know we test every two years, right? <laughs> you know, like, you, you need to test. You need to come try out for this. Um, so yes, the junior member program is alive and well, but it's like everything else, trying to get the, the younger people active and involved is a challenge. And for your, and for your I want to add too, for your local fire halls, the price of equipment is unreal. And just? It continues to rise. So if you can support, we all like to eat, if you can support your local fire companies through the fundraisers they do, the, the barbecues, the chicken barbecues, the, the fish fries are awesome. <laughs> if you can, if you can, you know, if you're driving by, stop. That's a way to support them. And, it, uh, you know, to echo that, you can become, a, you can be join, become a member, right? You can, it's, I think, Hepburn Township, it's like $82 a year or something we pay as a household, as a contribution, right? So. You know, people go out and spend money on cell phones, they spend it on sneakers, they spend it on McDonald's. Sit down, call your local volunteer fire company and say, you know, how much is it to be, to be uh, a member and, uh, and make your contribution? Because that adds up too. If you have 8,000 residents, you know, and you're collecting 80 bucks a person, it helps pay for training and other things. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Jason. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Uh, 9.3. This is a one-year extension with Montango Enterprises. Montango is the only tire recycling uh, that we have in the bid. This will probably be the last extension for tire recycling. And we will, we will be doing this one-year extension with no increased cost or anything, but we provide recycling for car tires and large truck tires. Okay. Motion. I'll move to approve. I'll second. Oh, famous guy. So carried. Second, 9.4 is an improvement, approve an amendment to the agreement of Croft Chemical Company. This is a two year extension at no price increase, except for the shipping. There will now be a $25 per drum shipping fee. So, Croft is the company that we buy all of our leachate chemicals that we use to treat leachate lines, uh, deodorizer, the neutralizer that we put through the trailers and so forth. Uh, so that is one of our heavily budgeted items each year. But no increase for two years is a good thing. We just have to pay for shipping now. Okay, a motion. I move to approve. I'll second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, so carried. And part of that as well, 9.5 is an equipment rental agreement with Croft Chemical. So we get another two year extension with the with Croft Chemical. We get to use their trailers as long as we're using their their chemicals. It's for their trailers, and they allow us to use their trailers to distribute and push the the neutralizer throughout that white pipe system you see. Okay. No motion. I move to approve. I second. All in favor say aye. 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 So carried. Nine point six is a continuation. I was before you a month ago, commissioners. This is an amendment to the agreement with the Federal Bureau of Prisons that we do that we provide the electricity. This is a 60-day extension. Before I was before you with a 30-day extension, hoping that our tenure contract would be through the Federal Bureau of Prisons system, ready for your approval, and it's not yet. So I'm now going to go to a 60-day extension, hoping that by within the next 60 days, I can be before you for a tenure extension. Okay, got a motion. I move to approve. A second. Clear <coughs> side. Aye. 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 So carried. And lastly, then goes with that is 9.7. This is the master power purchase and sale agreement that we have with Energy Power Partners that actually runs the cogen plant for us. And this too is a 60-day extension. No motion. I move to approve. I second. All favor sign. Aye. Aye. So carried. Thank you, thank you, Jason. Appreciate, appreciate it. Jenny. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Uh, this is a vote to approve submission of the 2022 FAIR grant application to PHFA in the amount of a million dollars. Um, and it is for 10 projects this year that go to support affordable housing. And I'm just going to quickly read you the 10 projects. <laughs> the first one is American Rescue Workers. It's the rental assistance program, and we will be submitting for $100,000. The second is the Asbury Foundation for the Albright Life Rental Assistance Program for $48,000. Then the Greater Habitat for Humanity Scott Street Parcel for $25,000. Uh, 
and Habitat for Humanities Home Preservation Program for $25,000, the Lycoming County, uh, Clinton County Joinder Board, their Interim Housing Program for $52,000, STEPS Supportive Housing Program for $200,000, STEPS Regional Homes in Need Program for $200,000, STEPS Urgent Need Home Repair Program for $50,000, Transitional Living Centers Master Leasing Program for $200,000, and finally, YWCA's Liberty House Program for $100,000. And grant applications are due November 18th. Okay, and a motion. So, Mr. Chairman, I think we're gonna have to take these at least individually. I need to recuse from the second one because that's a program that uh, we are involved with in my business, um, the Asbury Foundation. Okay, can we take them separately, Jim? Um, sure. Or you can well, make take all of them. I'll make a motion. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Take it. Okay. I'll, I'll move to approve all of them except the Asbury Foundation. I'll second that motion. All favor say aye. 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 So carried. I'll make a motion uh, to approve Asbury Foundation. I'll second. All in favor say aye. Aye. And Opposed, to recuse. Aye. Uh, Mr. Solicitor, is the correct term recuse? Abstain. Abstain? I don't think it's abstain. I think it's... That term is abstain, correct. Oh, thank you. Okay. Oh, well, please don't argue that. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make a comment on all of these. Sure. I think it's great, Jenny, the job you've done in finding a cross-section of hitting our housing needs from various mm -hmm. points. You know, whether it's the American rescue workers where uh, people who are very struggling at one end of the economic scale, the Asbury Foundation helps seniors, which we've not done in the past. Yep, it's new this year. It's new this year. Uh, the Habitat for Humanity, uh, the Memorial Home Scott Street Parcel. I, I, say, I like to say that like coming Habitat for Humanity is the uh, ultimate step in the housing uh, getting back into housing, right? You may start in one of these programs that assisted, you begin working, you begin to get stabilized, and eventually you get into a home, right? Um, the joinder, uh, folks with MHID issues, right? Um, STEP, supportive housing, uh, regional homes in need, that's the, uh, all of these, urgent home, urgent home is for our folks who have a crisis, right? Transitional living centers, the master leasing, getting people back on their feet, and of course the YW Liberty House. So I really compliment you on that. You, it shows your experience here in the county in understanding the housing problems. Yeah, and we have good community partners too, so it's a very um, wide range of programs this year. Absolutely. Great. Thank you, John. 9.9, Chan. Okay, commissioners, as you know, um, the deadline for the RACP uh, business plans are due November 6th. Um, DeSalvo's uh, needs a second um, extension for their project. They're finalizing their, their, their business plan, but they need to continue to get some complete design revisions and engineering estimates for their project. So the million dollars that the state had awarded to them through RACP they're requesting an extension until April when they'll be able to put their business plan in. Okay. And this is not county funds. This is entirely, they, they applied with our blessing, but this is all state funds. And it's passed through. Yeah, it's passed through. Okay. Okay. They're handling all of the administration, <coughs> all of that through, through their uh, consultant. Okay. Uh, motion. I'll move to approve. I'll second. All in favor say aye. Aye. So we and I just wanted to mention, um, John and I just met with Hutch this morning to talk about uh, radios and um, our ARPA funds, and we're, we're working together to come up with an idea of a way to do grants. Unfortunately, Maya left, so we'll let her know <laughs> that we'll be giving her more business. Please. Yeah. All <laughs> <I'll>, the business. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll, give, we'll give her more business because we're going to try and match the ARPA funds with some grants. So. Great. Okay, thank you. Last of 9.10, John. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. 
should let people know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, John Lavelle, Deputy Director for the Lycoming County Planning Department. Uh, pending uh, the Commissioner's approval today, um, the County's going to make its first award of the Housing Starts Initiative Program um, to support the uh, Woodland Heights development, which is within the City of Williamsport in the amount of uh, $34,696. And this is a board <coughs> that's actually contingent on a fully executed agreement with, with the company. Yeah, this is exciting because as we uh, discussed ARPA monies and we heard from developers and realtors in the area, we were informed something that was taking place nationally was also going on here was a housing shortage. Whereas normally there's 600 houses on the market, the 750 houses on the market like Henry County, it was down in the 150. Um, range and so we um, we spoke amongst ourselves we voted on um, we realized our money is going to be used what we did come out uh, of those discussions uh, was a, um, a program that was developed the housing starts initiative which would be two million dollars this year and two million dollars next year mm -hmm. to try to address the housing needs in our area mm -hmm. we've had several applicants apply to that that opened up October 1st and this is the first reward that reward that will be given out uh, underneath those guidelines. I can uh, you, absolutely. I'll, so this is um, project will be undertaken by the principals of T. Ross Brothers, who have a historically proven track record for residential development in the area. Um, specifically, the grant funds are going to be put towards sewer and water tap fees. Uh, the proposal is for. 20 uh, townhome units uh, on the Wisteria Lane uh, development in the West End. And um, so essentially this is a shovel-ready project. Um, all permits and approvals have already been acquired, so uh, uh, they're, ready to, they're ready to go. And the um, best part here is uh, at full build-out, the county is going to see a return on its investment within two years. And um, just from transfer fees alone at the sale of the properties, uh, it'll almost double the grant award. It's sixty thousand dollars in transfer fees after you sell twenty units. So explain to the public when you say return on investment in two years, you're talking about the amount of property tax and the, the transfer yes, tax. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Go and explain that to the public. So so. Um, the grant award here is again it's uh, thirty four thousand dollars. Um, I believe I didn't write it down specifically but I believe in, in property real estate tax uh, to the county itself not including school taxes or city taxes that's twenty thousand dollars a year uh, coming back in, in, into the into the county uh, tax rolls um, and then the the transfer tax which is paid upon uh, closing of a property um, for 20 units that would be sixty thousand dollars so it's so a pretty good return on, on a, an initial grant of a little bit more than $30,000. It's a very modest grant and uh, investment. investment. I, I think it's important for the public to understand, you know the old uh, expression, how do you eat an elephant? H how do we deal with the problem of taxes rising and the problem of, uh, of depopulation? Well, you got to do it inch by inch, and it's really, you know, slugging it out, 20 units here, 20 units there, and then some bigger things that we're going to talk about today also. But it's a significant first step in trying to build housing that will attract people from outside the community. Unfortunately, a lot of our housing stock is over 100 years old, and that's great if you happen to like a house that's 100 years old. But if you're coming from a state like Florida or Texas or wherever where a lot of the housing is relatively new um, and you're looking for new housing, it's harder to find that. So this is part of it. And also the income bracket this is targeted to uh, is what we would probably say middle income people, right, mm -hmm. on these houses. And so, uh, so the public also benefits for the, because obviously those costs would have been passed on to the public. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. The cost that the developer has. So when we do this, we're both building our tax base and we're also trying to attract people to the community and uh, help people get into homes uh, by, by lowering the, the cost. You're addressing two issues. You're attacking the housing crisis at the same time. 
you're increasing your tax revenue by growing your tax base. Right. By putting the tax base on the current residents, you're growing that tax base. Yeah, that's our goal. That's what yep. we're trying to do. Yeah, grow that tax base. Okay. That's how you eat an elephant. <laughs> you know they're in danger. I know. Okay. <laughs> and a motion. I'll move to approve. I'll second. All in favor say aye. 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 Just, anything else? Uh, just just to add that we will be in coordination with the commissioners reaching out to the other applicants to set up meetings, basically interviews, to, to review their, their submissions for consideration. Thank Thanks, you. John, for your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, I forgot yes. to say I need this letter for DeSalvo today because it's due. Okay, we'll sign right after the meeting. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Director. Commissioner, comment. So I have two things. Uh, the second will be uh, an update on the coroner, but the first thing I'd like to address is uh, the Lycoming Mall has been a, st a stable in our community for the past 40 years. We've witnessed a once vibrant and robust mall that was heavily utilized in a steady decline over the past decade. Over the years, we have witnessed an economic decline that added to the unemployment and taxes being reduced due to appeals. Many anchor stores and businesses within the mall have left. This past year, we saw a $79,000 reduction in taxes after an appeal. Currently, they have a handful, currently there's a handful of stores that are still open at the mall. The mall is one subject that many in this community discuss on a regular basis with the hope that prosperity will shine from the other side of the arch that sits at the entrance. It sits now in the eastern end of the county in our growth corridor as a sad empty shell of what once was a great location for shopping, families, and fun. It reminds me of downtown Williamsport 15 years ago that had many storefronts empty and resembled a ghost town. Through a great deal of hard work by several in, the, in our community and a shared vision, they have brought downtown Williamsport back and it continues to grow with an exciting future that once was cast off as a town of yesteryear. Recently, the Lycoming County Chamber scheduled a meeting with the commissioners and advised us that a group of developers that shared their vision of the restoration of the Lycoming Mall. We met with the Chamber and the developer to hear that exciting news that would apply a positive impact in the middle of the addition, in the middle of the addition of the recently constructed Geisner Medical Center and the current growth of the Lycoming cross, Crossings. The Board of Commissioners believe that the acquisition of the mall by these developers will bring new life with employment opportunities, possible housing, and increased tax revenue for the county. The county will be exploring a five-year loan at 3% interest. The developers will be a third of the collateral into the agreement along with a local bank. And the local bank and the county will be lending equal amounts of the two-thirds. The county's portion will be a $5 million loan for a five-year period at 3% interest. The monies will come from the Act 13 fund. As the commissioners weigh this decision, we want to emphasize that this is a loan and not a grant. We have received feedback that the developers have also met with local state officials who are very favorable and express positive opinions on this project and would help boost it in Lycoming County. They are also exploring funding options that the state may be granting. This is an investment in the growth corridor of the county that has the potential to pay dividends and rewards for a generation or more. The mall adds a quality of life aspect to our community. Basic necessities such as shopping can be accomplished locally without having to travel. 
The price of gas is making that more difficult for the majority of us. The current de decline of tax revenue is a burden that each resident shares when a tax appeal is won. The difference in reduced ta tax revenue is less money available to provide services. The local bank board of directors will be meeting in mid-November to discuss their approval for their portion of the loan. The county and the bank will share joint lien holders on the loan as co-equal first lien holders. This information is being presented today to inform the public that we would like and invite feedback prior to us placing this on a future agenda for a vote. It's important as we utilize public monies on all county matters that we engage with the public for respectful and important dialogue before those decisions are reached. At this time, I would ask if my two colleagues would like to make a statement, followed by Jason Fink of the Chamber, who's the president who has joined us this, in this, this meeting this morning. Would either commissioner like to make a statement? Yeah, sure. Um, just one statement because you uh, read about everything there. So, uh, but under Act 13 money, okay, and understand the importance of what this natural gas industry has given to not only our community, but, you know, uh, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia. Um, it's, it's really important um, that we support this industry, um, not overburden it. And, and trust me, they, there's uh, a number of areas, like even in uh, uh, eastern Ohio and western Pennsylvania, where the growth of that industry is going to, you know, really pick up. Uh, we're looking at Act 13 uh, and, and the drilling picking up in the next year, year and a half. Um, the country's going to need this energy to at least stabilize the, the increase. Um, but I also want to, you know, uh, Commissioner Mayor Beto on many occasions uh, emphasize the fact that, you know, our, our industry, our um, Pennsylvania's uh, tax on the industry is, although it's nice to have, it's very low in some regards, and we want to be able to protect uh, some of that uh, uh, money that we we use from them. Uh, I'd, I, it, it's very difficult to understand how the industry works, but imagine that it's coming from our state, it's underneath our feet, and we have to be able to uh, meet the demands not only of our state, but of the world. And we as Pennsylvania should benefit from that. Um, so, um, you know, I hope that the county taxpayers will understand that we are working very hard to protect that their tax dollars. This is $5 million. It's, it's Act 13 money, but it's their money. And, and the commissioner mentioned two ways that are very significant. The first way is that first lien position on the property. Typically, if you go to buy your house, the bank is in the first lien position. And even if you have a second mortgage, they're in second lien. And what that means is that second lien cannot foreclose if first lien is there. And only recovers what's left after first lien recovers. Well, we fought very, or we proposed and said very strongly that we wanted to be in first lien position with the bank. Uh, and that's, that's part of the deal. So um, this is not decided, but I want the taxpayers to understand that we've worked very hard to protect their money. So that's one thing. And the other thing that the commissioner mentioned, which is very important, um, the total amount involved here is $15 million, split three ways five from the county, five from the bank, and five from the purchasers. And we share a personal guarantee with the bank on $5 million 
two and a half million for the county and two and a half million for the bank. That means that if this project does not come to fruition, we can, to recover the money, go after the personal assets of the people involved. Also something that any time you walk into a bank to do a business deal, you sign a personal guarantee unless you happen to be an incredibly well-capitalized uh, business that is larger than most of the businesses here, most of our small businesses. This is going to protect the taxpayers also. <coughs> um, the 3% that, that Commissioner Metzger mentioned results in the county bringing $750,000 into our Act 13 over the five years. That's what the 3% is. Um, so again, we look for the public's interest uh, input on this, but the positive thing about it is it's, it's, it's working to try to move that property from a series of half-empty concrete structures that will, over time, deteriorate and uh, eventually become more of a liability than they are you know, in their current condition. To move it from that to something which gets into the conversation we had earlier about increasing our tax base and repopulating uh, the county. If we, if we, and the, and the developers involved have a track record of doing good, creative, forward-looking uh, things. So imagine you're driving to Virginia and you see off the highway like a, I don't want to call it a planned unit development, but something where there's houses and shopping and other things going on. Um, it would be exciting. It would be exciting in attracting people. So it's, it's unusual. I don't know, Commissioner Messier, you've been here for almost 12 years now. Have we ever loaned that amount of money to anybody? No. no. But I, I'd like to add this. If there is going to be that kind of growth of that building that uh, I don't think anywhere in the agreement states uh, the use of local businesses. But I would hope that uh, the developers consider using our local businesses, our local workforce, if they can. Well, that's a good um, point. That's a good point. And, and, and just for, to be clear, we don't have a document in front of us when you mention an agreement. We don't have any document. So this is, for this is, this, this is for informational purposes. This is information that we've, we've tried we to work public, out. Yeah, we want the public yeah. to know about it. Right. Up but front. we don't, so we don't do it flippantly. No. We don't do it flippantly, but we do do it with the hope that we're beginning to plant a seed to uh, build the future and repopulate the county, bring people to the county. That's got to be our mantra. That has to be something we think about every day. What are we doing to bring people to the county? I know Mr. Fink thinks about it. The three of us think about it. We all have to begin to think about it. And I think anyone Because we're losing population, yeah, yeah, right? You're right. I think anyone who drives by that mall currently gets a sick feeling in their stomach to be honest and and what could be possibly there could be huge and bring population to this county and visitors like it once was and and these developers have that track record in our state they've done that in other communities right so at this time i invite jason fink to come forward and address this matter Thank you, Commissioners. Um, just want to uh, provide some background as to why we, uh, first of all, came to the Commissioners uh, with the, the request. Um, for those who may not be aware of DCD programming, um, there is a program called Business in Our Sites. Uh, it's a program that is structured for uh, development projects like this uh, that is uh, primarily a loan pool. Um, unfortunately, uh, the legislature has not been uh, investing in that program, uh, and they are fully subscribed at this time, uh, being uh, in a position where they've given all their loan programs, all their loan proceeds out uh, for projects. Um, and unfortunately, the, the earliest that they would be in a position to consider any loans uh, for projects will be what they've said to us at DCD is next fall. Um, the contract that the uh, buyers uh, have right now with the current mall owner, uh, they need to close by the end of this year. 
Um, actually, it's a little bit earlier than this year, but uh, no later than this year. So obviously, from the perspective of being in a position to wait uh, for that program to reopen, uh, they were not in that position. Um, that is why we, we turned to the commissioners uh, to see if there was a way that we could creatively replicate uh, what that program does uh, with the understanding that it was a loan request. It was not a grant request uh, to be able to assist them in being able to acquire the property. Um, the developers are already moving forward uh, in other aspects of uh, being able to tap into existing programs that they could uh, access uh, to be able to work towards their vision in redeveloping the mall property. Uh, they've already submitted for a PennDOT multimodal uh, grant uh, to be able to assist them with some of the, the roads. If you've been down at the mall, you know how bad those roads are right now. Um, and also some of the things that they need to be able to do and being able to uh, put into plan into effect their plan uh, for the, the mall redevelopment. Uh, the other thing that they've uh, gone after is they have uh, made a request uh, the RACP program, uh, which was recently opened, uh, they've got a request into the state for that. Uh, both of these grants they anticipate hearing uh, in the coming months. Uh, we understand the RACP grant awards could be announced uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, so they're anxiously waiting to see what other support they would be able to access for this. Um, you did note that uh, it is a, a development group that has some ties uh, to Pennsylvania. Actually, um, there are three partners in this group. Uh, the group is called FanVest. Uh, one of them actually lives in Muncie, in the borough of Muncie. They're a Muncie borough resident. Uh, the other two live over in the Center County area. So from that aspect of it, they have a commitment to the community. Um, this development group, partners involved with it, uh, have been involved in other developments here in our county. Uh, they've uh, most recently, uh, they've done a couple of commercial developments uh, that are notable along the Golden Strip. One is the Chipotle uh, and the other is the Texas Roadhouse, but they've also been involved in other projects here in the county, both industrial wise and uh, commercial ventures. So uh, we feel very comfortable and that's why we felt comfortable in being able to bring them to you. We you know, know our name is uh, out there as well when we bring these projects forward uh, and bedded them pretty heavily. Uh, and had actually worked with them on other projects, so it was pretty easy from our end of it. Um, and being able to, to ask you to, to look at this, and again, as we stress, this is a loan, um, and, and pretty much replicates exactly what the terms of, of that program that the state has with the business and our sites. Um, your interest rate is, and I uh, will note, your interest rate is actually a, a point higher uh, than what, uh, what the business and our sites program uh, has right now. Uh, it's set at 2% for counties like ours. They do have a 3% level, uh, but those are for counties with a, a, a greater uh, unemployment rate uh, from that side of it. So we're, we're in a good position from that aspect of it uh, and being able to see that you're doing better than what the business center sites program. It is a five-year loan though, uh, which how they, they structure that program. So we appreciate uh, the county stepping in and being able to consider this. Uh, the bank is in their process right now. Uh, I was just with the bank earlier this morning uh, and got an update from them. They're in the process right now of reviewing all the things that they need to uh, to be able to present this to their uh, loan uh, committee. Uh, and then also once that gets approved, it'll go to their full board for a decision on that. But they, as noted, uh, they do anticipate having that done here. Mid-month, later this month, we do have some holidays coming up and stuff uh, that may impact that. But uh, their goal is to have it done uh, no later than the end of this month. Uh, and shortly thereafter, I would expect that the commissioners would then be asked to, to vote on uh, the documents. And I know those loan documents are in the process right now of being developed as well. So, Two, two points, Mr. Um, one is that, you know, we outlined how the county tax dollars are being protected with the first lien position and the uh, personal guarantee. The underwriting is being done by the bank, right? Yes. So the bank is going in and examining all the documents that they do when they make a loan to a business. They examine cash flow, they examine assets, they examine everything, right? They do credit reports. And we will get reports on that, the same reports that are given to the board to be able to review. Uh, but that's a positive for us because we're not in a position to do underwriting 
uh, the kind of detailed analysis you need to do to make a decision on the, the validity of a loan. Um, just so the public understands, you know, whenever you start a project, everything looks great, and everyone is hopeful that it's going to work out. Well, sometimes things don't work out. And the, the, the important thing is to always have an exit plan at the end, right? Well, that's where the first lien position and the personal guarantee are the exit plan to protect the public. Because our primary responsibility, in addition to economic development, is to make sure that we protect the public's money. What do I mean by that? Well, by, you know, if the purchase price of the mall is 15 and for some reason this goes south, the bank and the county have $10, $10 million there. We... Uh, immediately have first lien position, the two of us together. So we take control of the property, which means that we've now acquired the property for $10 million. Nobody wants this to happen, and, and, but you always look for what is going to happen, right? And then in addition to that, we share a $5 million personal guarantee, which means that the bank and the county could recover $5 million in personal assets from, from the developers, leaving us essentially with $5 million that we have to figure out how to move them all for $5 million. I don't think any of that's going to happen. I think this is going to be successful. Uh, I think the three of us are thrilled that, that the bank is and the county uh, and the developers are working together to try to do this. The second point I wanted to ask you, how much are we leveraging, do you think, between the RCAP and the, the PennDOT Multimodal and the <coughs> other grants? Well, uh, I, I will tell you, I mean, I know what their ask was uh, for the, the, um, the RACP grant. Uh, that was an $8 million request. They're not going to get an $8 million right. award, let's be honest, uh, from that right. aspect of it. But you know, that's what they put in. Um, however, you know, in terms of the PennDOT multimodal, I believe it was a $2 million uh, grant request. Um, and, and all these are competitive, so that's why I state, you know, you put in what you really would love to see with the understanding that you're not going to get everything. So. I think in that regard, it's important for the public to understand that this isn't going to happen overnight. Correct. This is This not is going to be a five-year project, minimum. You'll see, it, you'll see it in phases. Exactly. I but think but think the you, point of that talk, is... He's talked about existing buildings that are down there that they can bring, because they have many connections with with numerous franchises and, and businesses that there's some that there are in discussions with they expressed to us that they can bring into those buildings immediately in a lease where others are going to have to take a look at and, and you know whether it's, it's you know demolition and new construction so it's a multi-phase process right but what that also does is it give us multiple chances to get state grants yes whether it's future PennDOT multimodal or whether it's leveraging with future RCAP grants. So it gives us a way. They won't, you know, PennDOT's not going to go dump money just because you want to fix a road Correct. if there isn't some connection to some economic development with it. So that's exciting also. Uh, it's I, like I, planting a seed. I think the other key aspect of it is, and, and um, they're not represented here today, but Muncie Township um, has experience the burden as well uh, on this and we advised them uh, about the fact that there was a potential for for this to take place um, they have been very supportive uh, as well um, they're not in a position to participate in this type of, uh, of venture um, but they they have seen the decline as well we it's been well noted um, that the current owner is uh, very derelict and making payments uh, for their public services that they do receive there. Um, and from that aspect of it, I think that you know the township is anxious to see a, a, a different owner sitting there um, that uh, would be able to repurpose this property. Um, it may or may not end up being commercial uh, in the way that we see them all sitting there right now. Um, I mean, because this is going to be a, it's going to be a different ownership, and it's a different time. I mean, it's, you know, malls were big at a certain point for communities of our size. Uh, there are still successful malls that are operating in much larger urbanized areas, but malls are being transfigured uh, and transformed right now. Our mall hasn't, unfortunately, and uh, we. It's good to see that we have a developer that is willing to take on this project and, and put the time and sweat equity because there's going to be a lot of work on their part uh, to take on a project. It's about 135 roughly acres uh, with about a seven to 800,000 square foot building sitting on it and it's an aged building. Yeah. 
You know, another point that you raise about that is that like Cumming County Water and Sewer Authority, if this gets developed and we get water usage up and sewer usage up, it helps us to pay for that infrastructure. So yeah, absolutely, it is it is exciting and um, yeah. very very exciting. I, I think I we're not patent. I think it, it's worth noting that, that the commissioners are going out doing this because I mean, as you said, it's it's Muncie. Uh, Muncie has the situation, right? Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's Muncie that has the situation, and and I appreciate the fact that. It is not a publicly owned structure. Exactly. But it is a very public structure. Yeah. And the, the activity that has taken place over the decades, and unfortunately the decline, it's a highly visible property. With the rerouting of, of, of 15 and the traffic coming up on 180 now that we're seeing right. already uh, with the throughway, um, you know, this, this is a very highly visible property. And I'll be honest with you, the concerns I had is the fact that nobody was going to take this project on. It was going to sit there under the current ownership, and we were going to continue to see the decline that was in place um, and not really be able to project because of, you know, what, what was taking place. Um, so I think it's a, it's a prudent investment by the county. Um, and the way that you're doing it, in doing it in a structure of a loan, um, you're going to get your money back. Um, and hopefully you're also going to see increased tax activity out of it. Um, you know, there's other developments that are taking place down there. Geisinger uh, just opened up a brand new hospital. Uh, looking at some of the other activities that are taking place there, you've got, uh, you've got the PA Gaming with Mealy uh, Entertainment there. Right. The, those, are, those are investments that are being made in and around it, and this will bolster uh, that aspect of it as well. So. Um, as you noted earlier, it's a growth corridor um, as well, and, and being able to see that the county is putting the resources into that growth corridor in a very wise manner. Um, because again, I go back to this is a loan, you are going to get your money back. Right. Yep. With a little bit more money, yep. actually. Yeah, absolutely. So tell okay. us what you think, public. Yep. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Okay. Um, the other issue I'd like to discuss is, as you're aware, we had a meeting last week with the coroner. Uh, we continue to look at options. Uh, three options we're going to be exploring at this point is I reached out to the airport authority. I reached out to the chairman of the airport authority um, after a meeting last week to, dis to ask them if they would have a discussion, the, the airport authority would have a discussion with the three commissioners about possibly uh, relocating the coroner down on their property. And uh, if you look at the corners around the state, uh, the corner in Berks County is located on airport property. And, um, and also other counties, the, the corner is located near, near airports. Um, so that would be one option. Option two is we will continue discussions, reach back out to the hospital to see if, if something can be worked out maybe on another parcel up there at the hospital. Um, and have those discussions with the hospital, see if they would entertain that. And then the third would be having discussions with a, a, uh, a landowner up in the Newberry section of, uh, of Williamsport, uh, just off of uh, 4th Street, across the bridge, and we would reach out to that uh, developer to possibly put the location there. So those are, we're not gonna put our eggs all in one basket, we're gonna try to have discussions with all three to see what the best option is. Um, but we are moving forward on this and uh, to try to get this done in a timely fashion. It's been way too long. We all agree it needs to get done. And I discussed these options last night with the coroner on the phone, and uh, he's receptive to having the discussions. They'll be included in those meetings as we move forward. Okay, anything else from the other two commissioners? Okay, anything from our public? Again. Tom, while you're coming up, I want to thank the uh, gentleman for being here today and, and for everything you do. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Tom. Good morning. I missed in my comment last week. There's a little, you know, activity going on. I stood up and you know, see me. So I'm sorry. sorry we missed you. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I'll try to have to say something. So, Go ahead. Okay. I don't know. Do I get double time tonight then? <laughs> and I miss a school board meeting. 
because my uh, I, my information was messed up. I, I didn't see it until after I got back home because I used to go over to the middle school and then I didn't realize it was at the high school. I thought, I don't know if they were still me enough time. And then later on, I found out it went to 8.30. Yeah, it lasted a while. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm usually there bothering them too. So, you know, someone's got to do it, I guess. Uh, here's a, a psalm. Psalm 12.8 says, um, wickedness... Um, yeah. When the when the wicked um, strut about on every side uh, is when the vile, when the vileness is um, exalted among the sons of men, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing wickedness uh, just everywhere, and it's just um, strutting. It's, and mainly because we kick God out out of our society and out of our government, and that's because I'll keep saying you know the earth countries founded on the Christian ethic, the Bible, the main founding document. And when you kick them out of government and the, and the churches don't say anything, you take prayer out of the schools, these are the results that we get. Um, and we're glorifying um, drag, you know, for kids. I saw the story in the Gazette. It wasn't their story. It came from the Associated Press. But I think that Associated Press is one of the worst uh, organizations this country has as far as it, news and information, because most of it's skewed and it's, it's trash. Um, but they're trying to glorify something that shouldn't be for kids at all. And it's a, God definitely speaks against that, against that type of activity. Um, and it's not, once again, not to attack the people, because those people are being used, being used by this LGBTQ community for profit and to get into to the schools for the transgender movement and things. And, and they silence, they purposely silence the gays against grooming and the transgenders against grooming. So a lot of honest people in those movements, I might not agree with what they, their decisions, but there's some people that really went through these, but they're adults. You know, they're not childish, they're not children, they're not trying to push children, but this, this whole thing is. And that's why, you know, if we don't start honoring God, we're not going to see prosperity. It's going to keep getting sucked up. That's, we, that's why we have the Bible. The Bible shows that when a country that was honored to God and given to God, when they turn their back on them, it gets worse. Jonathan Kahn, he's a, a, a Christian. He's a Jew uh, rabbi, uh, Messianic Jew. So he, his preaching, he goes into a lot of the... Uh, uh, prophecies and and how um, and just how God judged Israel at the time and how, how those things are coming right on our country and have been especially since uh, 911 and since the country hasn't uh, repented we're, we're just seeing more more of this stuff going on um, so I just encourage people to really think when they vote again to see what what candidates really stand for godly principles and what don't you know who don't, who doesn't? <laughs> My English is messed up, but uh, you know that's. I mean, it's, it's just important because no one's going to be perfect. But we want the godly principles to come through. It's not about Christian nationalism. It's not about Trump. It's it's about who is the best candidate in the in the moment. And, and sadly, we have a, a party system, a two-voted party system, because uh, third parties just aren't going to win unless they're hardly. Uh, popular and have a lot of push behind them. So you do a lot of times have to go for the lesser two evils, but the quick key is to stay on their butts when they get involved, when they do get elected. Uh, i got to say I'm very disappointed with, with Gene Yaw and uh, Jeff Whelan with uh, a lot of their inactivity for some things. Um, and so when we have that push to remove God out of things, you're also removing the foundation for our Constitution. And our Constitution has been being shredded before eyes for a long time. And, and one big area is when everything is taken to a court case, the courts aren't supposed to override legislation. That's not their job. And they're not allowed to say they have an opinion when something's, they think it's unconstitutional, but we're not supposed to be ruled by one man or a, or a panel of people. That's not, that's not our government. Why would you have a Constitution if that's how it's supposed to be? And just we'll just do what the judge says, and that's why we have problems, like when the Department of State's pushing on their 
will on, on this county on, on certain things with the election process now now with no uh, vote verification for dates or even signature verification that's not that's not our legislators supposed to do that so they can have an opinion they can say we well, can look at this but it's our will that's how that's it's our that's why we elect people to write these laws and they're not doing what we want them to do we get them out and we got to hold their feet to the fire so uh I just, uh, I just hope we um, we can really think about what we're doing. And one last thing, my heart goes out to the Huertas, uh, the, the fellow that died from Williamsport uh, last week. Um, and it was a really sad thing. I really don't know why, but what happened. He was a, a senior there at high school. And, um, oh, the that, student you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. A sad situation. It seemed like a really good kid. Thank so, you, Tom. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Any other public comment this time? Okay, hearing none, we complete our agenda. Our next meeting will be Thursday, November 10th. Yeah. I think I might have the original piece of the cast. Thank you, Brian. Uh, 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 well, we got to appreciate it. We can. He wants to do a picture. Let's okay. grab Scott. <laughs> <laughs> but they definitely have to set exactly. <laughs>